Before we, as we wrap up this entire year of, uh, or nine months or so of preaching, as we wrap up the book of Acts, I want to start with a little quiz. Um, I, I have done some of these in the last couple of months, and I know you, you love my little quizzes. So uh, I'm going to give you a line or two from a great speech in American history, and you need to tell me who gave that speech, okay? Find out how much you paid attention in the high school history class, although they're not very difficult. First one, ready? Four score and seven years ago, Abraham Lincoln, okay, uh, Gettysburg Address. Bonus question, what was the date of that speech? What year? Just give me the year. Bingo, 1863, give that man a prize. I don't know if we have a prize, but we'll give it to you if we have one. November 19th, 1863, double bonus. How long was the speech? 272 words. Took just over two minutes to deliver it, just over one type page, single space. Amazing. How about this one? Ask not what your country can do for you. Join me. Ask what you can do for your country. Who is that? John F. Kennedy, JFK, inaugural address, address, January 20th, 1961. Bonus question, how long was his inaugural address that day, the whole speech? 14 minutes. Just 14 minutes. Here's one more. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. Date? August 28th, 1963, at the Lincoln Memorial. How long was that speech? 17 minutes. See a theme developing here? Short speeches. You would think preachers would learn from that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Finally, how about this one? You're not going to recognize this one, but I want to give it to you anyway. What this team needs... is enthusiasm. <laughs> you don't know that because that was one of my brother's high school basketball coaches, like a man named Ivan Repass, delivering what was probably the worst pregame speech of all time. <laughs> In Florida, he was being bothered by a, a fly, and so it was enthusiasm. My brother still repeats that to this day. Uh, we are wrapping up our series, Shipwrecks, Riots, and Prison, The Reaching Adventure. We're wrapping up the whole book of Acts. Now, last week, actually, Tom Randall was here as our guest, and he preached from Acts 28. How many of you heard Tom last week on Saturday night? Okay, if you didn't hear Tom Randall last weekend here at West Campus, get up early tomorrow, go to the East Campus. He's preaching again out of our East Campus at 915 and 1045 if you're going to go, go to the 1045 service because I think 915 is going to be crowded. If you didn't hear Tom in person, make sure you hear this man uh, deliver his story. Uh, he's so much like the Apostle Paul. He doesn't like it when people say that, but he is. It's a treat to hear him speak. He's tomorrow at that campus. But I'm backing up a bit today and still wrapping up. We're looking at one of the great speeches of all time. We're going to be in Acts chapter 26. And this really serves as another kind of wrap-up of the whole series. Acts 26, uh, Paul is under house arrest, waiting to go to Rome, uh, where he eventually uh, wrote more letters that we have in our New Testament and eventually died. But we're looking through the whole chapter of 26 tonight. We're going to cover a lot of verses. I'm going to go verse by verse through because it's a fabulous chapter. So watch on the screens or open your Bibles, Acts chapter 26. Let me start with the first couple of verses here. Luke is writing. He says, so Agrippa, and I'll explain who that is in a minute. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I want to stop there. Paul here is um, under a kind of house arrest in a city called Caesarea by the sea. Now, we had a chance to visit this city a couple of months ago in the Holy Land. Uh, it's a major Roman port built way back in the first century by Herod the Great. It featured, among other things, a beautiful palace uh, that was the primary residence of uh, the Roman governors at that time. Uh, this was our, our tour guide. Behind him you see these, those columns. There was once a, a great palace right there on the sea. That's where Pontius Pilate would have lived um, during his rule as governor uh, of, of Judea. Uh, it also had a large hippodrome, which was like a stadium, an ancient stadium, where they held chariot races and horse races and so forth. Even in the ancient world, they had stadia, just like we do, where we have hockey games. I think there's one going on tonight, and football and stuff like that. It had a great theater. 
Uh, some people think this theater was where Paul delivered the speech I'm going to explain to you this evening. Now, Paul's audience here uh, consists mainly of three powerful men. There is a man named Agrippa. We'll talk more about him in a moment. He was the reigning king of the Jews, the Jewish king, but he's kind of a puppet to the Romans. There was Felix, who was the previous Roman governor who took the seat that Pontius Pilate once had uh, at the time when Jesus was crucified. Uh, then the, and Felix is the one who is responsible for holding Paul there for about two years. Now, he had appealed to Rome to go to Rome to save his own, his own life because he was a Roman citizen, and, but they haven't sent him yet because Felix was waiting for a bribe. He wanted to be bribed by Paul's friends, and that bribe never came. Felix is then replaced by a man named Festus, who's also in the audience. He's the ruling Roman governor. So uh, Festus is eager to resolve the situation with this man named uh, Paul because he knows that he's appealed to Caesar, only he wants to send Paul to Caesar, to, to the emperor Claudius, with an explanatory letter about why he's been held so long and what they expect the emperor to do about his situation. So we find out here that Festus has invited King Agrippa to join him for that very purpose. Now Agrippa, we need to say a few things about. Agrippa's full name was Herod Agrippa II. He's the Jewish king. He's the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, in the biblical story, tried to kill Jesus as a baby. He was responsible for what's called the slaughter of the innocents when all the little boys two years of age and under were killed in the region of Bethlehem. That was this guy's great-grandfather. Then his grandfather, Herod Antipas, was the one who had John the Baptist beheaded as a gift to this young girl who had danced for him. Then his grandfather uh, had martyred the first apostle, James. That was Herod Agrippa I. Or, or his father, I mean. So Paul knew exactly who this Agrippa was. He came from three generations of corrupt, godless rulers of the Jews. But Paul was not intimidated. Rather, Paul is very excited here. Why? Remember, Jesus said, you will be my witness. You will carry the gospel to the Gentiles before kings and before the children of Israel. Paul is getting to deliver his story, even though he's in chains, to kings, because King Agrippa is indeed king of the Jews. Then Luke says, Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. Now what does this mean? I've read this many times and kind of skipped over it. Stretched out his hand. Why is that important enough for Luke to say? Well, we can miss this if we don't know the culture. This was the posture of an orator or a lawyer in the ancient world. It's what they did when they stood before a group and they wanted to exhibit great confidence in their message. Can you put that picture up on the screen? You lost it all? Okay, she's shaking her head like she can't do that. Well, I had this great painting of Paul before Agrippa, and he's got his hand out like that. Let me explain what it means. This would be called a posture of power, a posture of confidence. Way back when I went to college for the first time in 1974, I went away to a school that did not have a, um, wasn't a Christian school. So I was exposed to stuff right away that was very different from what I was brought up with. And um, about two weeks into my freshman year, a bunch of guys were sitting around late at night in a dorm room. And I, I was a, a follower of Jesus at that time. I just wasn't terribly outward about my faith. Uh, and I, was, I hadn't really let anybody know about my faith at that time in college. We're sitting around late at one night, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this guy in the room looks at me and goes, oh, hey, coffee, what makes you tick? I was like, uh, excuse me? He goes, what makes you tick? I was like, uh, what do you mean? Because all the guys were gathered around. He goes, well, you don't drink like we drink. You don't talk like we talk. You don't swear like we swear. What makes you tick? And I'm like, uh, I, nobody had ever asked me that before. I grew up in a in a, in a, with a pastor's family and a church where everybody knew me. No one ever asked me to define myself before. Nobody ever asked me to, to explain myself before because everybody kind of knew everybody. And I mumbled through a kind of answer, well, uh, well I'm, I'm a Christian and I, you know, I'm a Christian. I didn't stretch out my hand. I didn't do what Paul's doing here. Paul's under arrest, probably in chains. He's defending himself before a former Roman governor, a sitting Roman governor, and the Jewish king whose ancestors have beheaded people that Paul knows. Okay, Yet he takes a position of power and confidence. Remember what Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans a little bit later? In Romans chapter 1 he wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's why Paul stretched out his hand. We'll come back to that a little bit later today. 
Continuing in the story, Acts chapter uh, 26, verse 2. I consider myself fortunate that is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now, now notice here, Paul begins with respect. A tone of respect. He knew who Agrippa was. He knew the family tree. He could have begun with a very antagonistic and even accusatory tone. He could have said, you have me in chains? You're the one that ought to be in prison. But he doesn't start like that. He starts with respect. And there's a lesson there for us as well. Verse 4, my manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. Many people uh, have told me over the years that one of the most difficult places for them to share anything about their faith is at home with their own family or with those from whom they came, those they grew up with. Because the response is either skepticism, come on, come on, we know who you were, we know what you were like, you were like one of us, or resentment. Oh, now you got a little religion, you think you're better than us. Well, Paul's dealing with a little bit of that here. One of the reasons why it was so difficult for him to go back to Jerusalem is that they all knew him there. They all knew what he had done when he was there. Verse 6, and now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I'm accused by Jews, O king. Paul here wants to make it clear. Now, Paul was trained um, as a kind of an attorney. He was trained in scriptures. He wants to make it clear. He's on trial for what he believes, not for anything he's done. He hasn't broken any Roman laws. He doesn't deserve to be in prison. This is a, he, he, he's a, uh, been accused of something that he believes in. Then he anchors his testimony in the common Jewish faith in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, because he's speaking before a Jewish king who respects the law and the prophets. Then verse 8. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Now, this is a trick question Paul's asking, a loaded question. Because it has a double meaning. First, Paul's definitely referring to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the very linchpin of the Christian faith. Paul knew that King Agrippa knew all about the claims of resurrection made by Jesus' followers. But like many today, he simply chose to dismiss those claims as impossible. I saw a recent Harris poll that said that today, uh, 74% of all Americans say they believe in God. 74%. Only 64% of Americans believe that Jesus raised from the dead. Which means people believe in God, they're just not quite sure he can raise someone from the dead. That's what Paul's saying here. If you believe in a God who created the universe from nothing, why do you struggle to believe he could raise one man from the dead if he chose to? Second, I think Paul here is also referring to the change that's taken place in his own life. A kind of resurrection from the spiritually dead. I think he's saying there's a direct correlation between the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and Paul's own transformation. Paul would later say it this way in his letter to the church in Ephesus. He wrote, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. Paul never forgot that the gospel was not about making him a better person. The gospel was not about getting a little religion into his life. Paul knew the gospel was about death and resurrection. Jesus really died, really rose again, and he, Paul, was really spiritually dead and needed to be saved from that spiritual death. The gospel is about spiritual rebirth. He continues, verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Who do you think Paul's thinking about here? We saw it in the video. I think Paul is remembering 20 years earlier when he approved of the stoning death of a man named Stephen. Paul knew the grace of Christ. He knew he had been forgiven for those things he had done. But I don't think Paul ever escaped in his memory the face of Stephen as he died as the first martyr 
for Jesus Christ. Verse 11, And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now this is the before part of Paul's story. You know who I am and you know who I was. A man driven by by his own testimony, he says, rage and fury. A man who was in every way spiritually dead. Verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, This is a phrase common among farmers of the time, to kick against the goads. A goad was a sharp stick used by a farmer to prod an ox or a donkey or something like that. And when when you poked it, the, the animal would kick against it, causing it to dig even deeper, spurring the animal to action. Evidently, Paul is saying that the Lord himself had been pursuing Saul of Tarsus for some time. I wonder if you know what it's like to be pursued, goaded by the Spirit of God about something in your life, maybe even now. He's goading you in some way. Verse 15, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to anoint you as a servant and and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I recently had a conversation just a couple weeks ago with a friend of mine from church who, was, who had some questions about a particular religious group, and he had reasons to be asking these questions. He said this group appeared to be a Christian denomination, but he just wasn't sure he didn't know enough about them, so he asked me, and I didn't really know that much either. But I did tell him to ask one question. Ask what they teach about Jesus. That's the main thing you need to ask. Christian churches and denominations can differ on all kinds of things, can differ in styles of worship, can differ on on church polity, can differ on mode of baptism, can differ on how we serve and observe communion. But to be Christian, they must believe certain things to be true about Jesus. For example, Jesus must be understood as the Son of God. That is, that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, one with God the Father. Jesus must be understood as being eternally existent and not a created being. Jesus was not a prophet. Jesus wasn't an angel, because even angels are created beings. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Jesus was and is God, eternally existent. Jesus must be understood as the final and perfect sacrifice for all sin. He must be understood as having been crucified, dead, buried, and risen again. In other words, eventually all Christian theology and all Christian experience comes down to Jesus. For Paul, it all came down to Jesus. You can hear it in his story. He didn't just have a change of heart about persecuting people following Jesus and throwing them in jail. He didn't just have a midlife crisis and decide to change professions. Paul had a personal encounter, a death and resurrection encounter with Jesus of Nazareth. And that same truth is descriptive of our own journeys. It's true for us. Whatever your faith background might have been, whatever church or denomination you grew up in, whatever tradition shaped your spiritual understanding, wherever the journey of your life has taken you, it all eventually comes down to Jesus. He meets you where you are. He confronts you for what you have done. He leads you from spiritual death to spiritual life through his grace and forgiveness, and then he calls you to follow him into a new life. That was Paul's story. This is the second or third time he's told it. It's also our stories. He was saved from self-righteousness, pride, selfish ambition, hatred, and violence. He was saved for taking the gospel to the Gentiles before kings and to the children of Israel. And the same is true for us. If you have received Christ as Savior and Lord by faith, you've been saved from your own personal portfolio of sin. Whatever your stack is, you've been saved from that, and you've been saved for 
God's purpose in your life which is to take the transforming power of the gospel to someone in some way. All of us are called to do that. Now, it might be sharing your story with someone, a friend, a family member, a coworker. It might be offering to pray for someone at work. It might be sharing a ministry to the poor. We're all called to take the gospel to someone somewhere. Paul continues, verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. Right here at the heart of it, Paul says it's the gospel. The gospel, but the gospel anchored in Moses and the prophets. Why? Because he's speaking to King Agrippa, who is of the Jews, who understands the prophets and Moses. Verse 24, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus, the Roman governor, said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Several years ago I heard a pastor tell a story about a business executive in his church uh, who was a follower of Christ but had recently made a very generous gift to a certain uh, aspect of the church's ministries. But he calls the pastor and asks for a lunch appointment. So they go out to lunch, and as they sit down, the, the pastor says, well, what's up? Why, why, why the appointment? And his friend looked at him square in the eye and said, I think I need you to tell me I'm not crazy. I think I need you to tell me I'm not crazy. What, many, what he meant, of course, is that many in our world, to many in our world, the gospel sounds kind of crazy. And it seems even crazier to invest one's life and possessions and resources in gospel-oriented endeavors. So he wanted to be reminded, I'm not crazy. Festus is a Roman. He's a professional politician. He's smart. He's successful. He's a realist. He's a pagan. So he says, Paul, Paul, you're off your rocker. You're talking crazy now. I wonder. Have you ever had a time in your life where you've been made to feel like your faith sounds a little crazy to someone? Maybe in your family, maybe among your friends, maybe right after you became a Christian, you're trying to explain it. They don't say it in so many words, but you can hear it in their tone of voice. You can see it in their eyes. They're like, this whole Jesus thing, you're taking it a little too seriously. You know, are you part of some sort of cult? I think it's a little bit weird you give so much time and money to the ministries of your church. How can you believe that somebody rose from the dead? That's a, that's a little crazy. How can you believe that the Holy Spirit, this invisible thing, lives inside you and speaks to you? That's a little crazy. You're talking crazy. But Paul said, verse 25, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things. Now he's looking at Agrippa. The king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. Okay? Paul knows that Agrippa knows the story of Jesus. He knows about his miraculous birth because his great-grandfather tried to kill him the baby. He knows about John the Baptist being beheaded by his grandfather. He knows the story of the resurrection because his own father participated in the trials, secret trials that led Jesus to the cross. He knows all this, but he's pushed the truth away in favor of a life of wealth and status and comfort and power. And Paul's looking right at him right now. Verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to become a Christian? Paul makes a direct ask, do you believe in the prophets? This is a very risky question for both. It's risky for Paul because Agrippa can have his head cut off if he gets offended. It's risky for Agrippa because if he says no, he's denied his own people's tradition. If he says yes, he's open to whatever Paul says next. So what does Agrippa do? He changes the, sub changes the subject. He says, you think you can persuade me to become a Christian? 
Look at what Paul says, verse 29. And Paul said, whether short or long, I would, I would, that, would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul completely turns the tables. Festus says, you're nuts, Paul. Agrippa says, somewhat sarcastically, you think you can convince me to become a Christian? In other words, I'm not the one on trial here. And Paul says, actually, yes, Agrippa. Yes, I do. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but yes, King Agrippa, with everything that's in me, I hoped and prayed to convince you to believe and follow Jesus because it's the most sane thing you could ever do. Paul is gracious, passionate, and utterly unapologetic. Verse 30, Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, that's Agrippa's sister, uh, and those who were sitting with them, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man has done nothing, is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. Okay, three takeaways tonight. First, the gospel will always sound crazy to some. It will. It will always sound crazy to some. A pastor named Matt Chandler writes this, We are never, ever, ever going to make Christianity so cool that everybody wants it. I like that. That's true. Because the gospel is about death and resurrection. The gospel tells you, tells, you, tells me that you are not good enough, smart enough, strong enough, cool enough, or religious enough to raise yourself from the dead. You can't do it. Someone has to do that for you. Only Jesus can do that. The gospel sounds crazy because it tells you that God loved you before you loved him. It tells you God loved you when you denied him. God loved you when you blasphemed him. It tells you God loves you when you don't deserve to be loved and forgive you when you don't deserve to be forgiven. The gospel sounds crazy because it tells you you can't earn or deserve God's grace. You can only discover it. You can only receive it, celebrate it, and share it. But you cannot earn it. And that sounds crazy in our world because some will always want only what they deserve. And the gospel will always sound crazy to those who refuse to believe in a God who loves with such extravagance and so indiscriminately. The gospel, however, is not crazy. Look at one transformed life. Look at the life of Saul of Tarsus, become Paul the Apostle. Look at the life of someone you know. Look at your own life. Look at my life. One transformed life tells me the gospel's miraculous, but not crazy. Secondly, the gospel isn't crazy because it's grounded in history and truth. All series long, all the book of Acts long, Luke has been hammering away at details, places, names, events, as if he's saying, look, people, I'm not writing fiction here. I'm not making this up. Check it out. Read the history books. Do the math. It's all right there. None of it happened in a secret. None of it happened in a corner. Luke is writing this book while people who were witnesses to the resurrected Christ were still alive. It's a living document. Paul says, read the prophets. They all said he was coming. They all said this would happen. The whole Old Testament paved the way for the coming of Christ into the world. And third, because the gospel is grounded in history, like Paul, we can be both bold and respectful. One writer said we can be aggressively graceful. I like that aggressively graceful. Luke tells us when they gave Paul permission to speak in chains, he stretched out his hand. He stretched out his hand with great confidence. I look back to that day, 30-some, almost 40 years ago, in a college dorm, and I wish I'd stretched out my hand instead of mumbled through something. I wish I'd said, I'm glad you asked. Sit down, guys. Come on in, boys. I got the greatest news you could ever want to hear. I wish I'd stretched out my hand, but I didn't. Maybe the Lord has given you an opportunity somewhere in your life to stretch out your hand and share the story with great confidence. It's the most sane thing people could ever hear. Paul's in prison. Paul's in chains. But when he stretched out to share his story, when he shared the gospel of Jesus, he was the most powerful and sane man in that room. 